morning. My name is Lauren Lipovic, and I lead Esri's public policy practice. And I am joined today by my colleague Bonnie Stair, um, a solution engineer. And this is the second webinar in Esri's GIS for Public Policy web series. If you missed the first introductory course, you can look for that on the web. There is a recording. Today, Bonnie will share how congressional offices are using GIS to map constituent correspondence. She will then provide a technical demonstration walking you through how to actually map your own constituent correspondence data. I will be watching for questions in my queue, so please submit questions throughout the webinar today in your chat window, uh, and we'll be sure to answer those throughout the session. So with that, I will turn it over to Bonnie um, for today's session. Thanks, Lauren. So to get started, this is just an overview of what I'm going to cover today. Um, so I'm going to start off with an overview of the ArcGIS Maps for Office technology, which is what offices are using to map their constituent correspondence. Then I'm going to talk about some of the other scenarios or situations you might encounter as you're trying to map your data, um, such as how you aggregate your data and how you adjust for population. Um, then we'll talk about styling your map and sharing it, and those different options that are available. And then we'll look at time-enabled data, as that's another interesting aspect that you can bring into these correspondence maps. And then I'll just wrap up with a few uh, gotchas in terms of formatting your data that you might want to be aware of. So to begin with, just wanted to give a couple examples of um, how offices have been using this technology to map constituent correspondence. Um, and Senator James Risch's office has been nice enough to allow us to use their, their example data um, uh, for demonstration purposes. Um, so we're going to take a look at a couple examples um, using their data. So this first example, this is a, a web application that shows a comparison between support for and opposition for um, immigration. So they chose a single issue uh, to focus on and then broke their data out uh, in terms of um, you know, support for it or opposition to it um, and then calculated a rate of correspondence. Um, and then using one of the web application templates provided um, through, through Esri's technology, um, we can easily compare those in this sort of swipe, swipe enabled template. We can click on a, a zip code in this case and um, get the statistics for it, what was the count of correspondence, what's that rate per thousand people, and then swipe across and see the same thing for the, for the support position. Um, so in this case, you know, they're mapping by zip codes, which is really the most common um, pattern that we've seen offices using. Um, you're not limited to mapping by zip codes, but that seems to be the common thread um, as to how offices are collecting their incoming correspondence. Um, that's the geography level that seems to be the most popular. So that's what we'll work on today. Um, another example from Senator Risch's office, um, this is another map of a particular issue. In this case, they looked at Second Amendment correspondence. And they actually tracked this over a period of about a year um, and maintained that, that date information, that time information, um, along with the, the counts of correspondence that they were seeing. And the software will recognize this and can actually let you um, put a time slider into the map. So you can explore your correspondence data um, not just in space, but also in time. So you'll see a couple periods throughout the, the year where there were higher, higher amounts of correspondence coming in. Um, and these actually coincided with um, shootings that took place and were, and were you know, in the news. Um, the end of the year was the shooting in Sandy Hook, and then the middle of the year was the shooting in Aurora, Colorado. Um, so they're able to see, um, you know, is this issue always popular, uh, or is it something that people are just responding to the, to the national dialogue about? And what's great about making these correspondence maps um, is if you're trying to plan for your members' activities, if they're going back to their state or district to do town halls, um, you're able to see what issues uh, those people in those zip codes or neighboring zip codes that you might pull from as, uh, for attendance at your town halls, what issues those people really care about and are really passionate about and are corresponding um, with you on. So you'll be, your member will be better prepared to address those issues um, knowing you know, it's a popular topic in that particular part of the, the state or district. So with that, let me go back to my slides. So the technology that's available to you uh, to make these sort of maps is called ArcGIS Maps for Office. Um, and again, in the intro session, we went over um, the, 
the access to ArcGIS Online, which is Esri's cloud-based technology. Um, uh, you have, as a staffer, you have um, access to that free to your office. Um, so the Maps for, Maps for Office add-in is, uh, as the name implies, it's an add-in for Microsoft Office. Um, and it is freely available to you as a download from Esri's website. Um, it would just require that you have a login to the ArcGIS Online uh, system. So for the house, um, we have House Map is the the account, the ArcGIS Online account for you guys. And for the Senate, um, it's called SAMS. So um, we'll have some information at the end about how you can get connected to that system if you're not already, um, if you don't already have a username there. Uh, but once you've got that, you can download this um, little add-in for Microsoft Office, and it lets you add these dynamic interactive maps to Excel as well as PowerPoint. Um, we're going to focus on Excel today because that's where you can actually take your own data and put it into a map. Uh, PowerPoint would obviously be for the, the presentation side um, of that data. So today we'll focus on Excel. So what I want to do now is just give a demo of the very basic um, use of ArcGIS Maps for Office and what that looks like. So I'm going to bring up a spreadsheet. So first off, um, notice that I'm working with an XLSX document. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, Excel, you know it can support many different file formats. Um, to use the ArcGIS Maps for Office add-in, we do require that you save your document in this format. So just take note, um, you must save it as an XLSX format. So when you install the add-in, you'll get a new tab um, in the Microsoft Office interface, and it's called ArcGIS Maps. Um, so when you flip to that, you'll see some tools. Um, the first thing that you have to do is to sign in. So I'm already signed in to the, to the Senate's account. I'm signed in as an admin. Um, but you would just use the same credentials that you would use to sign in to the ArcGIS Online system, either House Map or SAMS. And then you'll have the ability to add new maps to your interface. Now, for the co correspondence data, um, obviously, there's lots of different systems used throughout congressional offices for, you know, maintaining and storing um, your correspondence data. Um, so, you know, once you can get your data out of that system, if you can put it into the spreadsheet, we'll be able to map it. Um, so the absolute basic format that we would need is a column that holds the location, in this case, the zip code. Um, so if you have a column that um, can store each of your zip codes, and then presumably you'd have another column that represents the count of correspondence or the number of pieces of correspondence um, you know, coming from that zip code. So as long as you can get your data in this format out of your CRM system, um, you'll be good to go. Uh, we do recommend that you format your data in Excel as a table. So if you're not familiar with that, um, this data that you know I could have just typed in by hand, or maybe I copy and pasted from another system or another document. Um, it's it's just a a range of cells right now, so um, there's no sort of a table intelligence associated with this. Um, so we can handle the data when it's formatted this way, but as a best practice, we highly encourage you to format it as a table. So to do that, um, select the first cell, so the the first header there. Scroll to the end of your data, hold down the Shift key, and then select the last cell. So this selects all of your data, uh, but notice we're not selecting um, any empty extraneous rows there at the at the bottom. Um, so don't just uh, you may be tempted to just you know hold and drag and and you know highlight these two columns. That's going to select all those empty rows at the bottom. We don't want that. Um, so just select the cells that have data in it. Then you go to the Home tab and Format as Table. And then you can choose whatever formatting and colors you like. So I'm just going to choose a blue here. So now, um, now this data is formatted as a table. And you can tell that it's a table because the Table Tools um, tab will, will be active. Um, and also, one thing you want to note, if you've got a spreadsheet with, with multiple tabs and multiple tables, um, this is also on this um, design tab. This is where you can make note of your table name. Um, so it's important, again, if when, we're, when we go to map, um, we want to make sure we know we're mapping the correct table. All right, so back on my ArcGIS Maps tab, now I'm going to go ahead and add a map into my interface. 
and it's going to go through and look across my, my workbook here and see all these tabs and all these tables. Um, since I'm, this is my active table right now, I'm clicked on it, um, it's, it's selected the correct one for me. But again, if you're ever in doubt about which of these tables you want to be mapping, um, just you know, select it and then go to the Design tab. Um, so then, the next step is to specify the location type. Again, since this is very simple data, um, the software is making a best guess uh, based on the fact that I've named one of my columns zip. Um, it's kind of flagging that as a keyword, and it, it's knowing that I want to map it to zip codes. Um, just so you're aware, you're not limited to mapping to zip codes. Uh, there's many other types of location data that we can handle. Um, if you are tracking things at the street address level, we can specify that. Maybe you just have a city name and you want to place a point over each of those cities. Um, or if you're even tracking things by counties or, or census tracts or something like that, um, we can match to those types of boundaries as well. Uh, but today we're going to stick with zip codes. And then finally, um, we can specify how we want to style this. Again, very, very basic data here. I only have one other column in my data set uh, to drive the styling, um, so it's chosen count for me, and that's fine. Um, some of the options, you might want to use the option to place a, a dot over the center of that zip code, and it'll change the size of that dot based on the count. Um, but the other option that we see you know, most often in the examples that I showed earlier is using uh, color. So we'll just fill in those zip code boundaries and shade the you know, darker colors representing greater amounts of correspondence. So I'll go ahead and add. Um, right now it's asking if I want to aggregate any data. I'm not going to do that since we have unique zip codes here. So we'll go ahead and add that data. And again, we're, we're picking on Idaho as our, as our demonstration state. Uh, so here we've got those zip code boundaries that have now been color-coded by um, this, this count uh, of correspondence. And again, I can click and get uh, the statistics for that particular zip code. So that's the, the very basic um, premise of, of using the Maps for Office add-in. Um, I'm going to dock this map, so I'm going to anchor it here onto this sheet. Uh, so if I flip to my other, my other tabs here, I can um, use different maps, so just know that there's that sort of floating and anchoring capabilities um, of these maps. All right, so that was the basics. Um, so what if you're exporting data out of your CRM system um, and it's kind of leaving in um, rows for, you know, multiple rows for a single zip code. So again, you might have um, had several months worth or weeks worth of data and it's got an entry for each of those months or weeks or whatever. Um, and so you've got data where there's not a unique, you know, the zip codes aren't unique in that zip code column. Um, so what we can do is aggregate that data. So if you want to sum up across, um, across the zip codes just to know, you know, what is the total for the zip code in this, in this time frame, right? Um, there's a way to do that in the software. We saw an aggregating option as I just went through the last demo. Um, that is an option. You can absolutely use that. I tend to recommend using, um, creating your own pivot table to aggregate. Um, just because for one of the other demonstrations we're going to do, if you want to add any new data into your, um, into your table to calculate a rate off of, um, you'll want to have it in its own separate table and not, not just a pivot table. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a pivot table from um, an existing data set and then copy the, the results into a new sheet that we can then format and use for the other demonstrations. Um, so those are the, the basic instructions for, for how to create that, that pivot table. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate what this looks like. So I'm going to go to my next tab here. So now I've got basically that same data. It's already been formatted as a table. Um, but notice that I've got multiple records for uh, you know, some of these zip codes. So 83201, 83202. Um, so what I want to do is, you know, add up the total for, for each of these um, zip codes. So I've got a unique record uh, in my table. So to follow the instructions, what we'll do is, you know, just make sure you've selected somewhere in the existing table. Then you go to the Insert tab and use the Pivot Table option. So since I have already was uh, focused on that table, it's selected this table for me as my source. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it in this worksheet, and I'll just click here on any of these, one of these empty cells to, to place that pivot table. 
So it's empty right now. I need to use the little tool over here to specify you know, what type of aggregation I'm doing. So I'm going to drag the zip code uh, field down to the rows. So now I've got um, you know, just one entry for each of these zip codes. So you can see 83201, 83202. And then the counts will become our values. So I drag that in there, and then I get the summation here in this other column. Um, just note there's other ways, there's other you know, um, calculations you can perform on these. If I wanted to calculate an average, I could, but in this case, the default is sum, and that's good because that's what we want. Um, so that's you know, really kind of the, the ba most basic kind of pivot table you can probably make, um, but it gets the job done for us. So what I'm going to do now, again, I could, um, I could uh, just select the data for um, these rows, these uh, now unique zip codes that we've got. So I'm just going to scroll down here until I get to the end. And once I've got that data selected, notice that I didn't, I don't want to select the, uh, the total. And I also don't want to select the headers because Excel will think that you just want to copy the, the pivot table itself, but that's not what I want. I want just the raw data. So I've selected that, I'll copy it, and then I'm going to go to another tab that's empty right now, and I'm going to paste this, uh, this data in here. And I left room up here at the top, I left an empty row so I could put in a new header. And again, I'll call this just zip and count. And then again, following best practices, I will format this as a table. And I'll be ready to map this. So again, I can go add a new map, let it select this table, this new one that I've created, which again, just to confirm which table it is, it is table 13. And I'll go ahead and use the colors and in this case, again, we could have aggregated using this tool here, um, but because I want to do more formatting to this table, this source table, um, I wanted to, to create it in its own separate um, standard table, not a pivot table. So here I'll select do not aggregate. And now we should get you know, basically the same view that we had before, right, since this is basically the same data. Okay. So that was aggregating. One of the other things that you've probably noticed, if you looked um, particularly in the um, example from Senator Risch's office with the time-enabled map, um, you know, those in those sections where there were where there was a lot of data, there was a lot of correspondence coming in. Uh, the darker colors, meaning greater correspondence, tends to always be around population centers or, or major cities. Um, if you think about it, this is pretty obvious, right? If you have areas, zip codes with greater populations, um, that's where you're going to get more correspondence from than from less populated places. Um, so this, you know, if you held up that map to someone and didn't tell them that it was a map of constituent correspondence, they might just assume that you just mapped population. Um, so it's not actually really all that meaningful to just map the pure counts because it's really just going to look like a population map. Uh, but what we can do within Maps for Office is use a tool to add population data and calculate a rate. Uh, so we call that process normalization. So we're normalizing out uh, the data for population. So the Enrich Data tool lets us add in um, demographic information, including population. Um, and then we can just, once we add that new data in, we can create a new column um, and use just an Excel formula to calculate that rate or percentage. Um, this can also be done through styling, which I'll, I'll show a little bit later, um, but I think there's benefits to doing it this way um, over just driving the, the styling um, by the rate. So um, once you've uh, calculated that column, you can then, within your map, just copy your original layer and then change the style to use that new rate column. So let's walk through what that looks like. All right, so I'm going to keep working with this map. Um, so this was the map that we just did where we aggregated the data. Um, so notice up here along the, the toolbar for our map, we have a tool called Enrich Data. So I'll click on this. 
and we are focused on the US right now, so it's kind of defaulted to that. Notice there are other countries in here. If, if you open this and the first time and it, um, it doesn't have all these categories, um, just check this drop down and make sure that you've selected um, the United States because sometimes it might default to, to global, which will not show all of these different categories. Uh, but for the US, we have a wealth of data that you could add into your spreadsheet. Um, again, we're going to focus on population today, but just so you're aware, there's you know, thousands of other demographic and behavioral type of um, variables that we can add in. So if you wanted to know what was the median household income in each of these zip codes, or the median age, or the race and ethnicity breakdowns, or how much people spent on health insurance, for example, we could add in a column for each of those um, reflecting those statistics. Um, so feel free to explore these. Um, they may be useful in some of your other work, uh, but for the sake of uh, this demonstration, you know, we want to normalize by, by population. Another common variable that people sometimes normalize by is uh, per capita. So again, if you wanted to look at the, the income uh, per capita um, uh, section, you could do that. Um, but I'm going to go back and we'll look at population. Now if you wanted to um, look at the, the official census uh, population, we certainly have that. So we've got, you know, the most recent 2010 uh, population numbers from census, uh, but ESRI also has a team of demographers that uh, does yearly estimates for a lot of these demographic variables, as well as five-year predictions. So notice the, the ones that are listed under popular um, is the, the most recent um, annual estimate, so 2016, and then the five-year prediction um, from that. Um, so if you're comfortable using those, you know, that might be slightly more um, accurate, a little more, a little more uh, timely than what is coming from the, you know, decennial census, especially the further we get away from the decennial census. Uh, so we choose, if we uh, want to choose this variable, we just click the checkbox, notice it, it added it to my little bucket up here, I hit next, um, and then I'm going to use the default to just create a new column. So I don't have any other, you know, column preset up for this, I'm just going to let it create a new one. So we'll go ahead and add data to the system. Notice it filled in pretty quickly here. Um, depending on how many records you have in your spreadsheet, as well as your network bandwidth, you know, since it's reaching out to the internet, um, you know, that might take a few seconds or even a few minutes. Um, so once it's successful, you'll get this little notification. So now, um, I'm going to minimize my map for a minute there. Now we have our new column representing that 2016 total population. Um, so now I can calculate a rate from this. One thing that I want to do first, however, uh, is filter out any zero values. So there may be some zip codes that are, you know, um, just unpopulated. There was no, there was no population listed there. Um, they could be, you know, sometimes there's a zip code set up for, for campuses or hospitals or organizations like that. It's not actually people's residences, so there's no population living there. Um, so one thing you want to do, and again, this is why one, one reason why we like using the table formatting is you get these um, filters that you can apply very easily. So I'm going to choose to, I'm just going to unselect the zero value here to make sure that my table doesn't have any, any zeros in it. So we'll just kind of filter out that, any zip codes that um, had a zero population. Since we're going to divide by the population, um, you'll get some, some crazy errors because uh, computers don't like dividing by zero. So now that I've got this, I'm going to set up uh, another new column, and I'm just going to call this rate. Um, again, you type it next to the table, it automatically adds it to the table formatting, another great use of, of using tables. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start typing in a formula. So I'm just going to start with the, um, I want to take the count, and I want to divide it by the total population. And so this could just be a percentage, um, but just to help format my numbers a little bit better, I'm going to multiply this by a factor of 1,000. So this is a rate per 1,000 people is the way to, to phrase that. Um, and again, table logic is great because I type it into one cell and it, it does that calculation for the entire rest of the table, so I don't have to you know, drag, drag that formula down at all. Um, so now I've got um, this rate available to me. So I go back to my map, I'll bring that window forward again. <coughs> so 
So in my original layer, um, I won't be able to style by this new, this new column. I basically need to add the data again. So what I'm going to do is just copy my layer and it'll make a new, sorry, new copy of it. There it goes. So it's just re-adding that, that data again. You saw the little progress bar. Um, and in this case, uh, instead of the, um, instead of the, uh, the original count as our, as our um, uh, variable that we're going to symbolize by, now I can choose the, the rate that we just calculated. So I'll just flip to that variable and notice how it'll change the, the look of our map pretty, pretty intensely here. I'll say OK. Let me just go ahead and turn this other one off. <clears throat> so this was our original data that was just the, uh, the count, um, but I'm going to change this. So this is the one that we've changed to just be the, the rate. Um, so notice it's a drastically different looking map than the one we had for counts. It calls out very different areas of the, of the state um, as you know, being very passionate about this issue and writing in um, for whatever this issue was. So we highly recommend doing that, that normalization. All right, so styling and sharing. So you've seen the, the styling dialogue come up a few times now as I've uh, been creating these maps. Um, so uh, just to, you know, brief overview, there's basically there's a lot of different ways that you can style. We could probably do a whole other webinar just on styling and classifications and um, when you use different types of classifications. Um, but we'll try and highlight a few of them um, so you can choose the, you know, the how you break up your data into different uh, bins and color groupings, themes, um, transparency, um, as well as the base map that shows up underneath your data. So all that can be configured here within, uh, within Excel. And then if you are going to share this uh, data, there's a few different ways to do that. Um, obviously, when you save your Excel document, the map will be saved with it, so you can always um, come back to it that way. But if you want to make other people um, give other people access to it or 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 put it into other formats, um, you can share the layer. So you can, since you're connected to ArcGIS Online, you'll be able to share um, the layer that you've mapped or the 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 map that itself that you've put together, including the base map. Um, you can simply take a screenshot if you want to, you know, paste that into a slide or into a do another document. Um, and then there's also the create slide option, which again is integrated with PowerPoint. It'll basically add a new slide to an existing PowerPoint um, with a screenshot of the map in there. So it's kind of a, uh, an easier process than to go from your Excel data into a presentation mode. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a look at some of these options in the map that we've been building. All right. so. So this is this is our, our rate map that we've put together. Um, if I want to go in and adjust the styling, if I've if, you know it comes up automatically when you first add the layer to the map, but if you've kind of closed out of it, um, you just go back to the layer style button up here on the on the menu. So this takes me back into this, and there's there's a lot going on in this dialogue. And as I mentioned, you know we could do a whole other seminar just on. Um, you know when we when we use different types of classifications and colors and things like that. Um, obviously, today we don't have that much time. Uh, but notice one of the first things that you can do is divide uh, divide your variable by by another you know another type of variable. So I mentioned when we were talking about normalizing this data, um, you can if I you know if I just added in the uh, the population column. Um, I don't have to calculate this rate column. I could have just um, left my map um, styled by the um, styled by the count. So if I take count and then if I divide that by population, then um, you know I can basically get the same view of the data as as if we calculated this rate. Right? That's just the percentage. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is. Um, if you would, you know, if I didn't calculate this rate column, I didn't have that in my spreadsheet. When I click uh, a point or click a, a, a feature on the map, I wouldn't see this rate reflected there. Um, so, you know, if you're presenting this data in this interactive way, 
um, and you want people to be able to click and see what that what that rate actually is, you know that that statistic wouldn't be reported there if you just do this, um, you know, divided by within the styling. Um, also, you know, the divided by we we put the factor of a thousand in here to help, um, you know decrease some of the decimals on this. So if you didn't, you know, if you just do the divided by without adding a factor on here, your your legend might get a little messy and there'd be a lot of, you know, a lot of zeros in your decimals before you get to any meaningful numbers. So um, that's why I, I tend to advocate for actually calculating the rate column um, just so it's a little bit more, um, it's easier to present the data that way, I think. Uh, but we can go back here to rate. Like that. Anyways, so layer styling and the um, other options here are the continue or the classifications. So um, by default, it's going to use a, a what we call a continuous classification. So there's there's really no uh, sort of divisions. It's just kind of applying a, a graduated color ramp to your data. Uh, if you scroll down here to see the color ramp, notice there's these gray bars next to it, which is basically a histogram of the values in your table. Um, so in this case, you know, we have a lot of low values down here, um, and as we go to higher values, there's fewer and fewer, uh, generally, of, of these counts. It also calls out the average, so if you're interested in what the average of your data is, um, you can see that here. Um, so if we change this, you know, we'll see how the... Um, let me just add this data again real quick here. So I just want to get a, a new fresh view of this. Okay. So should be our rate. And so if I change this to natural breaks, you see how the map updates. Um, now we can identify the, n the number of classes. Um, so now we've got these sort of break values um, for, for this type of classification. Um, again, if I change this, equal interval, quantile, you see how the map can, can drastically change based on the, the type of styling that you're applying. Um, you know, if you're unsure, I think it's pretty safe to stick with the, the continuous um, classification. Um, and then, you know, a good suggestion is if you're trying to highlight areas that are, you know, really um, passionate about this, writing in a lot about an issue, and they're really vocal about it, um, you just want to kind of highlight what, what is above and below average. So um, you can use the theme option to drive that. So by default, it's kind of going from, from high to low. So it's applying, you know, a lighter color at low values and a darker color at higher values. Um, but we can kind of change that theme to use, you know, above and below a value, um, centered on a value, or highlighting extremes. So I'm going to use above and below um, to kind of focus this around, around an average. Um, so in this case, you know, this average is 37. So it's applied a, a ramp here, and it's, it's hard to see because the value, because this is so skewed towards low values um, you know most of the um, values are are down here in this reddish color um, for this ramp so if it's below the average it's reddish if it's above the average it's in the purple color um, so this you know really helps to identify you know what are the areas that are most most concerned about this and and writing in a lot um, and so we can also use the change symbol style if we want to um, choose a different kind of color variations if you don't like purple and red as the default um, you could come in and choose one of these other options um, just select the one that you want and hit OK this one's interesting it's got a neutral at the bottom so all the stuff that's below average is kind of gray and then just in red is highlighted the uh, the stuff that's above average um, so you know as a as a you know kind of good first order classification uh, or you know uh, styling if you use the continuous classification and then you know style it above and below the average that's kind of a good starting point for for interpreting these maps I would say uh, notice we can also adjust transparency um, the visibility range is basically how far zoomed in on the map you have to be before you see this data but you can leave that um, as all scales if you'd want so if this is our, our map, um, one other area that we might want to um, alter is the base map. Um, so by default, we're presented with a, a sort of topographic 
map underneath our data, which for this data is not really all that meaningful. There's, it's not really adding any value to see the topography underneath um, these counts of correspondence. Uh, so over here on the right, there's a little um, button underneath the zooming tools or above the zooming tools for um, uh, changing the base map. So these are all the base maps that you have available to you um, through your organization. And I would recommend using the one of the gray canvas base maps since they're very neutral. Um, they're good for letting your data kind of stand out um, without um, kind of overwhelming it and distracting from it. So either the light gray or the dark gray um, canvas base maps are a good choice. So obviously it helps make it a, a much more clear um, for <coughs> for interpreting the data. So with that, um, the, if you're happy with the map and the styling that you've set up and you're ready to make this, you know, to share this map somehow, these are the sharing options. So as I mentioned, I could share just the layer. So all that means is I'm sharing the, the zip code boundaries that I've color coded. Um, I would share those as a layer um, to ArcGIS Online. So again, since I'm logged in with credentials to either House Map or SAMS, um, this would create a new layer in your content within those environments. So when you go to the um, House Map or SAMS in the browser, um, you'll be able to access the layer that way, bring it into a web map, put it into an application, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, notice you can also choose here you know, how it's going to be shared. So typically, we would not expect you to be sharing any of this type of data publicly. Um, so most likely, you would, if you were going to share it, you'd share it with a, an office group you know, your colleagues that, that might want to see it. Um, I'm seeing all these groups here since I'm logged in as the admin. Again, you would probably only see the groups that um, you're a member of or that you've created if you've created any, any new groups. Um, so just be aware that you can set that sharing level here when you publish it. Um, so that just shares the, the boundaries themselves. Um, the share map option means uh, it, it creates a, a web map item in your content. So a web map is you know, a collection of layers with some formatting applied to them. Um, so in this case, it's really just the combination of the base map plus the uh, zip code boundaries that you put on top of it. So we kind of tie that together into a web map item. Again, that can be accessed um, in the map viewer in ArcGIS Online um, that you can then you know, further configure, add other data to, um, or put into a, a, an application template. Um, if you're not uh, intending on sharing this online, the other options are, again, creating a slide in PowerPoint, um, as well as just simply you know, taking a screenshot, it copies it to your clipboard, and then you can paste that into you know, Word or whatever other type of document you want. Alrighty. So that was styling and sharing. Um, last topic that I'll demo on is time-enabled maps. So again, this is an example we saw earlier um, of the, the data that um, you know, was collected over about a year, um, and then we saw the little time slider that let us scroll through that you know, kind of month to month. Um, so you can do this as long as you've got a date column in your spreadsheet. Um, again, just generally guessing in terms of how, what sort of time interval you'd want to be looking at. It might be monthly. It could be daily if you're getting that much correspondence and it makes sense to look at it on that interval. Um, but it could pretty much be any interval you want. Um, but no matter what uh, interval you want to look at, it at we, want, we would recommend you still include um, the full format for that date. Um, certainly don't do a four-digit year by itself. <laughs> Always put in a, a month and a day with that. Um, so again, even if it, you're just looking at it monthly, just put in like, you know, the first of the, first of the month as the day um, just to, to get that formatting in there. Um, Excel um, handles things best when you, when you give it that full format. Um, so once you just map, once you've got that in there, you just map it the same way you've, we've done the last few times, um, and then we can turn on the time animation through a layer setting, um, and then we can configure further some time settings and the time widget itself, the interval, playback speed, and accumulation. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Go over to example five, and just going to create a new map. So in this case, um, this is again basically the same data that we've had before. I'm just doing counts right now. This could be a rate if you wanted to go through calculating the rate like we did before. Um, and then notice I've got a, a date column. 
and again, this is monthly data, but we know we just put the first of the month in there to, as a placeholder day. So go ahead, add the map. <coughs> Make sure it's got the right table. Table, yep, so I want this table. And zip codes, count, that's all good. Same as we've done before. <coughs> All right, and then I'm just going to accept the default styling here. So once I'm out of the, the styling dialog, um, notice this little three-dot button over on the right. If I click that, these are some other kind of properties of the layer that I can configure. So I'm going to go to the time animation setting, and I'll just flip this just by clicking that little bar there. You flip this on. And if I had multiple columns, maybe I had two different date columns for whatever reason, I just you know use this drop down to specify which one is the one I want to use. In this case, I only have one. So I hit OK. So now you can tell that that's time enabled with a little clock symbol there. And notice that now this time widget has kind of appeared floating, floating over the map. I'm going to change my base map real quick here so we can see this a little better. Um, so here's the uh, default time slider, right? So I could go ahead and start clicking through this, um, but because the default is not set up to be monthly, I'm going to go ahead and change that. So there's a little gear symbol over here in the right corner. If I click that, this is where I can adjust the playback speed, slow or fast, um, and then the time interval is probably the most important thing that you're going to want to configure. So right now, by, the, by default, it's dividing it up into 20 equal intervals over the, the range of dates that I have. Um, so obviously, there's going to be some gaps in there. So I'm going to change this to display data in one month intervals. And then I'm going to leave the option to only display the, current, the data in the current time interval rather than cumulatively adding it up. And I'll hit OK. So notice it's adjusted the, the tick marks on my slider. So now when I scroll through, I'm seeing data for each of these months, right? just like we saw in the browser. So at this point, again, if I share this layer um, to the web, it will remember these time, the time settings that you've, you've set up here. So um, ArcGIS Online will understand that it's a time-enabled layer. Um, so when we go to the browser, um, this is that same data, just cooking show style. I already had it published up here. Um, but it remembers that I've got this uh, time enabled and it presents me with the time slider here within the map viewer in my browser. Um, so this is just like the example we saw from Senator Rich earlier that had the, had the Second Amendment correspondence that he had mapped. Um, so this is basically his same sample data that we just went through. And then once you've saved this as a web map, so either if I publish it from Excel as a web map or I you know, add the layer in to, to a new web map here in the browser, and I save it as a web map, I can then share this. Um, and again, if I want to make it available to a group, I can. Um, but one of the options is to put that map into a web application. So I just wanted to point out, you know, you may have seen other presentations from us where we, you know, we have a lot of different web application templates. Uh, we do have one that is time aware. So it knows about your layer having a, a time slider. Um, so I'm just going to preview what that, what that um, application looks like with this data. Um, so again, there's configuration for this app where I could go in and, and adjust you know, the playback speed and things, um, but you know, it's got its own little time slider built in here. So within this web application, um, people can see this data animated over time. And it's you know, just a nicer, cleaner interface than the, uh, the map viewer itself in the browser, um, and especially if you don't, you know, if you just want to give people a web link rather than sending them a, a screenshot or Excel file or something like that, um, this is a nice way to, to present that time-enabled data. So I just wanted to point that out that that was available to you. Okay. So just a couple formatting gotchas before we wrap up. Um, the, the, one of the things you may have noticed, uh, I can't remember if I showed that dialog or not, but um, the software will warn you about formatting your data. Um, it recommends that you format your zip codes as text. Now, it might be natural to think of zip codes as numbers, um, but actually we need to consider them as text because there are six states in the Northeast 
that have leading zeros, so meaning their zip codes start with a zero. And if you just typed in one of those zip codes into Excel, it's going to automatically assume that that's a number, and it's going to chop that zero off the front, because it doesn't want to waste space um, storing and showing a, a zero that's, that's meaningless if it was an actual number. However, it's not meaningless, it's part of the zip code. So we do want to format our, our data as text. Um, it's a good practice to get into in general, um, just because it, it will work better in the software. Um, but particularly if you're mapping um, zip codes in any of these six states, um, you definitely want to take this step. Um, so basically you can create a new column in your table um, and then you just use this little formula to format it. So you just use the text, uh, the text formula, um, parentheses, and then select your, your first zip code record in the original column. And then you specify the kind of five character format that we want. Um, for our text, so that way it'll preserve that leading zero and uh, it won't cause any, any errors in your uh, mapping. And then you just apply that formula to the rest of your, of your column. Um, so definitely be aware of that if you're from those uh, northeastern states. Um, and then column headers, just a couple notes on those, particularly this is important when you, if you're sharing the, the layers, um, once you go to that publishing step, um, we've seen, you know, uh, it'll, it'll often fail if um, you've got special characters in the header, the column names, right? Um, underscores are okay, but, you know, things like percents, symbols, and dollar symbols, we want to leave those out of the column headers. And then while we can handle numbers elsewhere in the, in the column names, don't start your column name with a number. Um, that will also uh, tend to cause problems. So just a couple of those little formatting um, things to keep in mind. Um, but with that, that was the content that I had for you today. Um, so for some next steps, if you don't already have an account to um, your respective ArcGIS Online systems, if you're from the house, you can call the CAO service desk to get a house map account set up. And if you're with the Senate, you can email the Senate Sergeant at Arms GIS training alias, and they can get an account set up for you in SAMS. And then once you've got that account, um, you can go to Esri's software page for Maps for Office with the URL displayed here, um, and that's where you can download the, the add-in for, for uh, Microsoft Office. It's a pretty quick installation, so it shouldn't take you that long. Um, and then you'll be good to go, and then you just need to get your data formatted and your proper Excel file and tables and all that good stuff, and you'll be good to go. Uh, just to remind you about some upcoming events, we'll be doing uh, our third webinar in this series on April 26th. We'll be talking about building story maps for public websites, press, and media. Um, you can register at the same URL that I've uh, registered for this webinar at. And then on April 27th, the next day, we're going to be hosting a GIS and public policy reception uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Sonoma Wine Bar down on Capitol Hill. Um, so we really hope you come and join us for that. We'll be sending you, you out some information about how to register for that after this webinar. Um, so we hope to see you there for some educational socialization. So um, with that, Lauren, were there any questions that I could answer? I don't see any in the queue. Thank you. Okay. Andy. If anyone has any questions once you get started, please feel free to reach out. You can email us at policy at esri.com. All right, well, if there's no other questions, um, thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you either in our next webinar or at our policy reception.